Okay, um, welcome everyone to this week's um, edition of Encompass Live. I am not your usual host. Uh, Krista Burns is on vacation this week. Um, my name is Emily Nimsikant, and until recently I was the cataloging librarian at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, I am now the head of cataloging at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Schmidt Law Library, but I have had this Encompass Live scheduled, so I'm decided to go ahead and continue to do it. Um, for those of you not familiar, the Encompass Live is the Nebraska Library Commission's weekly online event covering a variety of special of library activities and topics. It is free and open to anyone to watch. Um, the sessions occur every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central Time. And they are recorded, so they can be watched for free later if you miss a live session. They include a mixture of presentations, interviews, book reviews, anything library related really, and are sometimes presented by library commission staff and sometimes by guest speakers. Um, today, I guess I used to be library commission staff, but I'm a guest speaker now, but I'm your host and your speaker today. Um, and I just wanted to say before we jump in that if you have questions as we go along, please feel free to ask them, um, type them into the question box, or if you have a microphone, you can let me know in the question box that you want to be unmuted, and I can unmute your microphone, and you can ask that way. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, our topic today is metadata manipulations, using MarkEdit and OpenRefine to enhance technical services workflows. Um, once upon a time, met metadata manipulations meant something similar to what you're looking at in this picture, um, working with cards in the catalog. And that is no longer the case with electronic records and records coming in from a variety of sources using non mark metadata. And so today I want to talk about a couple of pieces of software, MarkEdit and OpenRefine. They're both free. And I want to talk about ways in which you can use them to make your life easier when it comes to working with uh, mark catalog records and other kinds of metadata you may encounter in your library. The first one I'm going to talk about is MarkEdit, and it is a freely available program that can be downloaded to your computer from the website at markedit.reist.net. Um, it is created by a wonderful librarian named Terry Reese, um, and he does this all on his own time. This is not his day job. He works at, I believe, the Ohio State University. So, and, but he maintains it. He does updates. He um, is working on a version right now to work on a Mac. So he's, it's just a labor of love for him and he's really awesome. So um, I'm going to tell you as much as I can about Mark Edit in you know half of this presentation. There was a lot more that can be covered. I've given a three hour class on it. Um, if you're a Nebraskan, the technical services roundtable of our Nebraska Library Association is getting Terry himself out to do a pre-conference at our State Library Association and that is a whole day thing. So there's obviously a lot more that I can cover in one hour presentation when I'm also trying to talk about another piece of software. So I'm going to give you the highlights. Um, but there are a lot of tutorials available if you go to this Mark Edit website. Um, this is where you download the software, but there's also a tutorials link on the side and that takes you to a lot of YouTube videos. So it, it's a really great resource when it comes to the software itself and when it comes to the help available. You can email the the creator, Terry Reese, and he responds quickly. There's a Mark Edit listserv that you can get on. So there are lots of resources for help with this um, software. Um, these are the features that I'm going to briefly uh, demonstrate using the Mark Edit software. Um, you can batch edit records. So if you have a bunch of Mark records that you need to add the same field to all of them, you don't have to go in and touch them all individually. You can just use MarkEdit to add the same thing to, or delete the same thing from all of them. Um, you can extract fields from records and use it to create a spreadsheet or you know, do something else with your data. They have a function called Mark Compare, where you can compare two different Mark records. Um, Mark Join, where you can join a bunch of smaller batches or even individual records into a larger batch. Or the opposite of that, mark split, where you can split a large batch into smaller groups or even down into individual records. Um, you can merge records with similar data to create a new record. You can actually use MarkEdit as just a cataloging software to create records from scratch if you don't have access to any other software that will do that for you. Um, a couple of recently, relatively recently developed features are RDA Helper, which is used to convert um, records created under the old cataloging rules, um, AACR2, and converts them to something 
I guess a hybrid record would probably be the technical term for it, but it has RDA, resource description and access, the new cataloging rules, compatible fields, and it does it all to a big batch of records automatically. And then there's also Mark Next, which is the newest addition to Mark Edit. And um, it is a suite of tools that sort of help you play around with linked data concepts and you know, using your Mark data in whatever the brave new world of Postmark is going to be with BibFrame coming from the Library of Congress and things like that. So those are the features I'm going to talk about. I'm going to actually jump out to where I have the software installed. Um, you can download it on your computer or um, yeah, I mean, they have a variety of options. Actually, let me go to the market uh, page and show you the download options. Let's see here. Um, mark edit. See that? If you go to downloads over here on the left hand side, there's the various options that you can download. Once you've got it on your computer, it, You know, it will let you allow it to install, you know, a desktop icon or however you want to get to it. Let's see, and I have it here. And what you'll see is, you know, any of the functions that you use the most often, you can customize the start screen so that you can use whatever works best for you. Um, the first thing I was going to talk about out is um, batch editing of records. So if you have a bunch of records that come in and you need to do the same thing to every single record, you can do that. The thing about Mark Edit is that it takes a Mark file and then converts it into its own format so you can work with it and manipulate it and then you have to convert it back to round trip it out back into Mark again. So the first thing to do is to go to Mark Tools and we want to make sure that the Mark Breaker function is selected from that uh, functions menu. And then you have to find whatever file it is you're going to work with. Um, I'm using an example, a batch of uh, records for documents from the federal government that um, we would get monthly files like this coming in when I worked at the Library Commission. And then we would decide whether we wanted to import them into our records. So you just browse through your computer to wherever the file is that you want. And then you have to specify where you want it to go. Um, this is the .mrk is the extension for the mark edit file. And then you hit execute and it will convert the records. Um, it tells you down at the bottom how many were processed. And then you click edit records to go through a screen where you can do just that. And so there were nine records in this batch. And these, um, they're for print, let's see, they're for um, print items, but they also are available on line. And so let's say that I wanted to add a field to all of these records saying that also available in a PDF online. And so I wanted to, I don't want to go through and add them all individually. So at the tools menu, you can choose add delete field. Um, this information goes in a 530 field. So you simply type in the field number and then whatever text you want it to say. So I'll just say also available as a PDF online. And then you click Add Field. You'll get a confirmation pop-up telling you how many fields were added. And then if you go and look, I know it's probably not the easiest to see, but they are indeed added to the field. There's a 530 field here. And it's the same for all the records. Um, you can also delete fields. Um, these have a 994 field that was automatically added, but we don't necessarily need to use that for anything. So I'm going to go back to that tools menu, go to add delete field. We want to delete 984. And since we don't care what the data is, you don't have to put anything in the second box. If there was, if there were you know, the same field that had two different types of data, you could just specify the data and then it would only delete the ones with that data. But I'm just going to delete the field. And again, it tells me nine fields were deleted. So that means it was done from every record. Now you can see nine records isn't that much to work with. You probably could go in and edit all these individually, but when you think about it, sometimes you get packages from vendors and there are thousands of records. It's really a time saver to be able to do things like this. Um, the next thing I was going to talk about was extracting fields from records. And this is a function that I used 
to uh, when we got these same government documents records, um, I, as the cataloger, would download the records from the, the government website, and then I wanted to pass it along to all the GovDoc staff to be able to evaluate whether we wanted to put these into our records or not. Um, let's see, I'm having some questions come in. Ah, and actually, two people asked the same question, so this is good. The pilot field doesn't have indicators or subfields. Um, yes, that was an oversight on my part. Um, if you do want to put indicators and subfields in there, you do need to type those into the field data box. You put the 530 into your field, and then the field data box, you do need to put in your indicators and subfields, and that was an oversight on my part. Excellent question. Okay, so I was talking about extracting fields. Um, as part of our workflow, I would extract information from the MARC records into an Excel spreadsheet and pass it along to the GovDocs staff just so they didn't have to stare at the MARC records and make sense of them. Um, so, um, I would... For this one, you need to go to the Tools menu. And you can customize this as to which ones you want to actually be on your home screen. But um, you can also find all of these functions in the Tools menu. And so you go to Export. And then Export. In this case, I wanted to export a tab delimited record so that it could be used as a spreadsheet. And so you choose Export tab delimited records from the sidebar if you haven't gotten there already. And then you need to set your file paths again, um, similar to what you did when we were editing the records. And so I'm going to choose that same mark records file. And then you need to specify a place to save it. And you'll notice it's going to be a text file, a tab delimited file, rather than um, a mark file. I'm going to save that, and then um, you select a field delimiter. I want it to be tab. That's what's going to tell it to go on to the next field, basically. And then you get to choose the fields that you want to export. Um, I recommend selecting normalized field data. That takes out all the um, mark subfield codes and things like, things like that. Um, so I would do, let's see. And so you can either check. Select them from this um, list, or if you wanted, you know, the title, you put in the 245 field. And if you only want a particular subfield, you do the subfield in there, and then add the field, and it goes up there. So whatever else you want, um, if you want the call number, you can do the 086 and add the field. Or let's see here, um, if you wanted, you know, a 110 for the corporate name. We're working with government documents here, so it's probably a corporate name rather than a personal name. Um, but it might not be in a 110. It might be in a 710. So I'm going to do that. And you might not actually want to add a subfield. You might want a whole field in the case of a 710, because it might be Health and Human Services and then a smaller division, Division of Public Health or something like that. So you might want to see the whole thing. If you do, if this is a process that you do often, you can save these under settings. Uh, click save settings and then you'll be able to um, save it as a, a text file so you can load that again the next time you want to do the same thing over again. If it's just a one-time thing, you can just click export. Um, if you are coming back to something that you've saved the settings before, um, you don't have to go through adding these again. You can just do settings and then load settings and it'll give you a chance to reuse the um, the settings that you would save before. In this case, we're just kind of demonstrating this as a one-shot deal. So I will just click Export. And it tells you where the file's been saved. And so at this point, I go and open up Excel. And I would open the file that I just saved. And you'll probably need to switch it so that it shows text files.
And I'll give you some options for how you want it to display. You do want it to be delimited so that the computer knows to use the tab character to separate it into a new column. Um, you want the tab to be the delimiter because that's what we saved it as. And when you click finish, you've got your various fields. Um, it looks like none of these had a 110. But we've got the call numbers, and we've got the 245 subfield A. So you can just customize it, and then you can do whatever you want with this spreadsheet. If you need to send it on to somebody else, or you need to use it to import it into a different system, it's just a way of getting um, a subset instead of a whole mark record. And I'm not going to bother saving this, because we don't need it until later. Let's see. Um, now we'll look at mark compare. And this. Um, is a case in which you take two different mark records um, that could be you know, records for the same item and they um, you, know, you want to see where the differences are. Maybe you've got a records from two different vendors and you want to compare the, the pros and cons of each of them. And again, this is something you could put on the home screen. You can also find it under the tools menu. And the examples I'm using are a record for a print version of a book and the record for a ebook version of a book. And then you have to specify where you're going to save the file. It's going to be an HTML file. I'm just going to call it Mark Compare. And then hit Execute. And then you need to go and find where your file is. And it just kind of highlights the differences between the two records. So um, the green, things highlighted in green are the things that are unique to the, the print record. Things highlighted in pink are the ones that are unique to the, the ebook record. So um, again, I don't necessarily know if you use it so often in your day-to-day -day work, but I think it could be useful when you're evaluating records, you could say from two different sets of vendors, and you want to see which one might be superior for your uses, things like that. So that's the mark compare function. The next thing is mark join. Um, and this is just what it sounds like. You take um, either small batches of records or um, individual records, and you show Mark Edit where to find them. Um, you have to start by selecting the destination that you're going to put them to, so I'm just going to call it Mark Join. And then Files to Join. Oh, I'm just going to pick some random files. And it's you know it's, it's pretty simple to go through that. You can open up the file, and instead of having two different files with ten and nine, you'll have a file with um, with nineteen records altogether. Um, mark split is the exact opposite of that. You choose your source file. You choose where you want it to go. Um, it's going to kind of put it all together in a folder. And then you can either tell it the number of files to split it into. So if you have, you know, a file with 5,000 records and you want it to be into, you know, five files, you can do that. Um, if you don't care about that and you just want to tell it, you want to say separate things into individual records, you can tell it to do one record per file. So you can either tell it how many files you want at the end or how many records you want in each file. And each of those can be useful in a separate, in particular situations. And so you process it. Um, I don't know why you would want to use a control field in the file name. I have never done that. It says nine files have been generated. Let's see, I saved it to my documents. And so all these M split with numbers, those are the various files. So now you have nine individual files rather than the one with nine files altogether. Um, let's see, you can also merge records. Um, so let's say if you had, oh, I don't know, um, 
records from a vendor that had pretty decent cataloging, but they didn't have um, OCLC numbers, and then you had a batch where they did have OCLC numbers, but they, you know, had been put in um, cataloging and publication, and they weren't very fleshed out, and you wanted to um, merge them together so that they had OCLC numbers, but they also had good quality records. Um, you can merge them. Again, it's just as simple as figuring out um, which ones you want to put together. And then you can either um, merge into source. So if you don't want to have a separate file at the end, you can just merge the second file into the first one. Or you can specify an entirely new file if you don't want to overwrite what it is that you had. And so it will give you a source. And I'll just call it merge results. Um, so if you only want to merge particular fields, you can choose that. If you want to merge them all together, you can do that too. Um, and so then you do that, and then your file is located wherever you specify it in your source file. So a lot of it is just you know, navigating to the right spot on the computer, telling it what to do, and then letting it work its magic. And again, I could go into much more detail on all these things, but we have a lot to fit in in um, an hour's amount of time. But please do stop me if you have any questions. Uh, I said you can also create records from scratch. Um, there is a mark editor function, which is either if you customize it so that it's on your home screen, you can do that. Or it is also um, let's see, under the file menu. And you just get a blank slate. You can do file, new. And then it gives you some options for starting with. So a book, a serial, visual material, et cetera, et cetera. So if you choose book, then it pops in the um, standard fields that you might use for a book. And so then you can just you know, type them in and create your records. So if you don't have access to a bibliographic utility, or if for some reason your local system doesn't allow you, or you're not in a situation where you can use your local system to create records, you're away from your, your library, and you really need the record. Um, MarkEdit is a good, very basic um, software for creating records from scratch, as well as uh, doing all these wonderful things to edit them. Let's see. Um, then there's also the RDA helper function. Um, as you may or may not know, cataloging is going through kind of a, a transitional period between the Anglo-American cataloging rules, AACR2, and uh, resource description access, the new rules. Um, if you use the RDA helper function, you can take a batch of AACR2 records and add things to make them RDA compatible. I would say they're not necessarily truly RDA records because you haven't gone back and looked at the item and made sure that you're transcribing exactly what you see, but they will be hybrid records that will work in a catalog with RDA records. I do I have known some people who have used this function to fully convert their catalog to RDA compatible hybrid records. And so you can choose which ones you want to add. Um, you know, these extra 340, 34X fields may not necessarily be important depending on what kind of material you're working with, but you can add them in. Um, most people will probably want to add the 336, 337, and 338. Um, delete your GMD, your general material designation, evaluate the 260 or 264 for publication information. So once you've chosen, and it, it can also um, expand abbreviations. So it will, if your record says P period for pages, um, and you can have it spell out pages. Oh, I have a question coming in. Did I miss how you convert the files back to MARC after you use the MARC breaker? Oh, yes. Um, skipping back to MARC breaker for a second. Um, if you are in Mark Editor, let's say we have already converted a file. I'll just open that one we were working with before when we were um, adding and deleting fields. Once you've done all the changes you need to do, and that can be either you know batch changes to add a field to everything, or if you want to actually go in and touch each record individually, um, under the File menu, um, Compile File into Mark is one of the last options, and then it will just let you name it as. whatever, and then that's how you save it, and then you can import that file back into your local system. 
That is a good question. Um, can we use the RDA utility on authority records too? You know, that is a really good question, and I'm not sh I have never been asked that one. Um, that is definitely something that I would say contact Terry Reese about. Um, he's really, really good. His contact information is on the market website, and he's very, very good about responding. Let me see if I can figure out. Um, to me, it looks like it's mostly referring to bibliographic records, so if I was pressed, um, I would say no, but Definitely talk to Terry, and it may be something he's working on. Who knows? Okay. Um, so I think that's answered all the questions. Um, if not, please go ahead and if I can order a question by accident, please go ahead and resend it. I'm going to go ahead and talk about the RDA helper function. Um, let's see, I have a a file of a ZR2 items, and you may need to. And it says RDA process has completed. Let me see if I can find that file. My editor. Open. I called it RDA items. And so I guess I didn't show it to you beforehand, but it has the 336, 337, 338. Um, it's added. Uh, Subfield E with RDA. Um, I know, at least for OCLC's practice, it's um, they generally prefer to put the subfield E up before the sub, you know, earlier in the string, but Margaret just puts it at the end. Oh, I have someone excellent um, answering the question that came in earlier. RDA or MarkEdit is Mark agnostic, so it'll work on all Mark formats, authority, community information, et cetera, et cetera. Awesome. So that is a good answer to that question. Thank you. So though that is the RDA helper function. Um, RDA Mark Next was the next thing I was going to talk about. Um, and it is just the Swedish rules. I'm not going to go into great detail about it because I haven't exported um, a whole lot myself, um, and we, you know, we only have so much time to get everything in. Um, the thing that I have found most interesting is the link identifiers, um, and you can use it to add. Let's see here. Um, I'm going to use one of my government documents files, and then you specify a save file. Let's call it linked. And what it can do is, uh, if you're familiar with the ideas behind linked data, um, one of the movements is to, instead of just putting strings of information in our authorized headings, is to also have a URI, a uniform resource identifier for a person's name or a subject heading, um, things like that. And so what this is doing is it's linking fields to the Library of Congress's linked data where they have concepts and people represented as uniform resource identifiers. And so if you would check that box and then hit process, and it takes a while. It's going to be on record two, three, four. And now I'll go find that file. Actually, I will. Um, it's a mark. File, so I'm going to break it into uh, the market files so you can see it more easily. Uh, 
And what it has done is it's added a subfield 0 in um, fields like a 100 field for a personal name, and it has a link to the URI for um, this person's name, Jennifer D. Schmidt. So this is kind of a, a baby step towards working with linked data. Um, I don't know that a lot of people are doing this widespread, but it, you'll notice it also has it for the 650 fields, the subject headings. Down here it has a link to the linked data version of the Library of Congress's subject heading. Um, so these subfield zeros are, you know, at least a concept that's out there, and so they are being added in by some people, I think. I don't, like I said, I don't think it's very widespread, but it, a lot of people think this is kind of a baby step towards linked data. We have to, you know, in the environments we're in, we still have to use the strings where we actually type in somebody's name in an authorized form, but we can also use these identifiers that will someday be more computer readable in order to make linked data work with our library data. So I think that's kind of cool. Like I said, I haven't explored um, a lot of the other Mark Next tools in detail, but there's information out there on the tutorials that Terry Reese has on his website, and so um, definitely if you're interested in that, that's something that I would recommend exploring. I will at this point also say that any of the links that I'm sharing, um, they will be collected into the Library Commission's Delicious website, and um, when you get the email that the recording of this is available, there will also be links to all these, so you don't have to worry about writing down URLs as I said there. So does anybody have any questions about Mark Edit before I go on to Open Refine? And if you know, you are playing around with these things after the fact and you have questions, definitely feel free to email me. I will be happy to do my best to answer them. I don't see any coming in at the moment, although you are certainly free to still go ahead and type some in if you happen to think of them. I'm going to go on now and talk about um, OpenRefine. Um, you may have also heard this called Google Refine. It is a tool that was originally used or made by Google, and now they just they call it OpenRefine. It's a freely available software that is available at OpenRefine.org. You download it onto your computer, and it's running on your computer, but it also run, it, it uses your web browser in order to allow you to actually interact with the interface. If you're interested in this, I will say right now there, as you can see, there is a book uh, called Using OpenRefine. That is a really good introduction to this um, software. There's also documentation available on the website. Um, I also mentioned a website called freeyourmetadata.org, which um, uses OpenRefine a lot to sort of show you how to mess around with metadata and do things with it that we are not currently doing in our um, libraries necessarily. So. Keep that in mind as well. That is also going to be in the delicious link after the fact, freeyourmetadata.org. And so here are the features of OpenRefine that I'm going to show you. Um, separating multiple values in the same field, analyzing the distribution of values in a particular field, and cleaning up inconsistencies. And I'll talk a little bit about this also has linked data applications. Um, so you do go to openrefine.org and download it. And then when you work with it, um, let me close this tab, it is in a spreadsheet like this. Um, I have already gone and uploaded a file to work with, a tab separated file. It did take a while, so I'm not going to show you that step, but I had a test um, set of metadata that actually I downloaded from the freeermetadata.org website. So if you don't necessarily have a project that you're working on, um, you can get some test metadata from there. This is from, I believe, the Powerhouse Museum. So it's some of their collection data. And so the first thing I said that we can do with this is separating multiple values within one field. Depending on where your metadata came from, you might have like a string of, say, subject headings separated by a semicolon or some other kind of character, and they're all smushed together in one field. Um, I know that my own experience with non-MARC metadata was working with Dublin Core fields in Content DM for the Nebraska Memories project that we did at the Nebraska Library Commission. And so we would string all the subject headings together in one field separated by semicolons. But there might be um, situations in which you want them to, each value to be in its own separate field. Um, so we will do that. But first, I have to create the project. Um, this is the screen you get after you import your data. Uh, I'm just going to call it Encompass 
live test because we are just working with this form, this Encompass Live presentation, and then hit create project. Um, let's see, I might have to start over. Okay. I tried to be proactive and do this ahead of time, but apparently it's undermining my best efforts. So now you can see the whole step. Um, I, I had a file of the Powerhouse Museum data, and it is uploading it into Google Refine or Open Refine. You'll notice that some of the screens say Google Refine, even though they, they pretty much uh, brand the software as Open Refine these days. And it says almost done. It's working on it. You can see the, the field. <laughs> The little bar is almost full. It seems to always get stuck at this last point, but um, it's it's working on it. And you know, while we're waiting for this, I'll just talk a little bit more about OpenRefine. I feel like it's particularly powerful for um, dealing with large amounts of data where you know you wouldn't necessarily be able to go through and touch them all and find inconsistencies. Um, you can analyze it to see, you know, did everybody use a geographic subject heading the same way, or did some people just put Chicago and some people put Chicago, Illinois, or something like that, and you, you could analyze thousands and thousands of records um, very, very quickly. Let me see how we're doing here. It's still going. Okay. You know, I tried to uh, <laughs> bypass this, and, and I'm, you know, best laid plans. The unknown, but it's working on it. I guess while we're waiting for it, I will um, just talk through some of the things that we would be doing, and what exactly I mean by each of these things. Um, separating multiple values in the same field. Um, it's just what I was explaining. Let's see. Oh, uh, what kind of? I have a question coming in. Good. What kind of files can be uploaded with OpenRefine? Um, let me answer that for you. I know they have a list. I think it's pretty flexible. There's there's a lot of things. Let me go to their website and at OpenRefine.org. I'm going to go check out their documentation just to make sure I'm not missing anything. You know, I think they can do XML. Um, they can do um, uh, CSV files, comma separated values, tab separated values. Let's see. Uh, FAQ, that seems like a good place to start. Uh, I'm yeah, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank here on a, uh, a definitive list of everything you can do, but I do know that it's uh, a it's a pretty extensive list. I an Excel spreadsheet, uh, a CSV file, like I said, a, a TSV file. Um, and this is of course not working. Let me try this again. I'll just start over completely. Yeah, you know, I was going to start from scratch, opening up Google Refine, Open Refine. Make sure that we're not encountering any glitches here. And it starts up with this little the start screen, and then it opens up in your browser. Let's see. Um, I have a question coming in about what software might you recommend to those who are new to Mark Files in general? Um, I guess that would depend on what, I mean, I, I'm going to need some more clarification from you. Um, do you have a local um, ILS system that lets you work with marked files? Um, I'll wait for them to respond to that. 
And so I'm going to try again uploading this file. Ah, uh, currently working in an internship with a corporation. Oh, that's interesting, because I would say that's an environment where you may or may not have a MARC-based catalog. Um, you know, if you're just working with, um, you know, actually creating your records, um, I mean, outside of just your local system, probably Mark Edit would be the the most basic software I can think of to um, work with Mark files. Um, like I showed you, you can create them from scratch in there. Um, you can edit them, and I believe you can also export them in files other than Mark if your corporation's software does not take Mark. Um, there are things that you can do to, um, you can probably export it as something else and then see if it's something that can be used by your system. Um, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm not giving you a great answer, but it's hard to know without knowing your local system. And yes, there are a lot of tutorials on YouTube for Mark Edit, so I think that will hopefully help you do what you need to do with um, with your system. Okay, so I'm going to let that run. Um, I'm kind of wishing I had screenshots to show you everything now, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about the things that I was going to tell you about OpenRefine. Um, when it says analyzing the distribution of values in a particular field, like I said, um, you can you know, tell it to look at a particular field, and they call it faceting and clustering, and so you can uh, do the facets, and you know, it will go through if you have, say, a place of publication field, and you know, it'll go through and tell you Anything that looks similar, you can group it together. You can do what they call clustering. So um, it will bring together things like Chicago, Chicago, Illinois, where Illinois is capital I, capital L, Chicago, Illinois, where Illinois is I, capital I, lowercase l, lowercase l, period, um, where Illinois is in parentheses, where it's not. It'll sort of let you evaluate um, anything that might be similar, and then you can say, you can choose one, so you can say, we want to do Chicago, comma, capital I, capital L, and it'll fix all of them just like that and make them all look the same. Um, so you, you can do that for, you know, simply analyzing and seeing where the differences are. You can clean up inconsistencies, whether it's um, things that were typos or whether it's things that, you know, policies have just changed over time, and so not everybody is doing things the same way. Let's see how we're doing here. I really hope this is going to work. So it's almost done. Um, yeah, I have someone in with their hand raised in the audience. I don't know if is that a request to talk with your microphone. Um, if you would like me to unmute you, please go ahead and type that in the question box, and I can um, certainly let you speak that way. Anyway, um, I'm beginning to feel less and less hopeful that OpenRefine will actually let us see what it is that I'm talking about. Um, I have a question coming in asking if the webinar will be archived, and yes, it definitely will. Um, you will get an email um, with the link to the recording. Um, Krista, our host, is out this week on vacation, so usually it's up you know, within 24 hours, but it might be next week. But you will definitely get an email with the link to the recording. We don't get to see the stuff about Mark Edit. So anyway, um, I'm not entirely certain I'm going to get to show you. Oh, oh yay, it worked. Woohoo. Okay, so here is the imported screen, and you can call it whatever you want, and then click Create Project. And this one takes much shorter. Uh, you see we have 11 seconds remaining, so this uh, Creating the Project link actually works much faster. I'm so glad this actually worked out. Um, 
We have a question coming in asking if OpenRefine can find inconsistencies with upper and lower case. Yes, I, I believe it can. Um, we can look for some of those when we're going through, but yes, it's a very, very powerful tool and it can it can definitely help you find almost any kind of inconsistency in your um, your metadata. So um, I was talking about how you might have you want to separate values in fields. Um, they have a category field here in this powerhouse museum metadata, um, which is a lot of subject headings, also some more descriptive type of stuff. Um, and so they are separated by vertical bars, which is an interesting character that I've never seen um, used for this before. But if you want to edit this, you can go to category, edit cell. You, each, each column has a little arrow next to the column name, and that is where you get all your options to edit things. Uh, if you choose edit cell and you want to split multi-valued cell, it will tell you or let you put in what separator it is, and so we have the, the vertical pipe. And you hit OK, and it works on it for a little bit, all much faster than the initial upload, I promise. And now it has split things into multiple columns. So this spacecraft and models and space technology used to all be in the same column, and now it has split them out separately. So that's something kind of neat for um, um, something you can do. Um, I'm getting a comment coming in saying that um, the, the vertical pipe is an option in Mark Edit for extracting records. So that's cool. And that's possibly where these came from. So once you've got things separated out and you want to kind of see what you're dealing with, um, you can facet it, and a text facet, when we're dealing with something that's mostly text, and then you watch over here on the left-hand side, you'll get a, a list of anything that is used in this field, and then the little gray numbers after it tell you how many times each of those things are used. So we have a lot of numerical things here. Um, this is the type of data that I'm not totally familiar with, so I'm going to skip down to the text things, and those will probably be more meaningful. Um, so we have four items where AC generators are used, two items where acid jars are used. Um, so you can, it's kind of cool a tool just to see. We have 69 things that were considered to be advertisements. Uh, it, it's a snapshot of your, um, your collection data, basically. And so if you want to do what I was talking about before and kind of see where some of the inconsistencies might show up, you can hit the cluster button. And this is where it shows you, and so yes, to answer the question that came in before, it does show you differences in uh, uppercase and lowercase letters, so things that are close, but otherwise, you know, they're, they're a little bit different. So let's say our policy is to capitalize the first word and then not capitalize the other ones unless they're proper nouns. Um, so it shows you these things. You say, yes, we want to merge it. Um, and then this new cell value is where you get to choose what they are all going to look like. So if you put it in there with a lowercase, um, second word, then it will take all of these ones where both of them are capitalized and it will make it look like that. And so you can do the same thing for this one, tell it you want to merge and we want to have the lowercase second, um, second word. Same thing for this one, we want to merge and do measuring instruments, etc., etc. And then once you've selected everything that you want to change, you hit merge selected and recluster. And then, so you'll see, those are kind of taken out of the equation. You've still got all these that are um, similar but not identical, and so you can go through and make more changes. And so it appears that most of the inconsistencies in this file are exactly what the question was talking about. They are differences in capitalization, but it could also be, um, you know, we can find things like what I was talking about before, where it has Chicago versus Chicago, Illinois, things like that. So it's really, really good at, um, finding things that are close but not quite and allowing you to standardize things across a lot of data. So you can um, so you're going to merge that one, merge selected, and then if you hit merge selected and close, then it takes you out of that option. So those are the main things that I've been aware of using this for and I've not had chances to play around with this as much as I would like. I would love to get into more projects where I'm able to use OpenRefine. Um, but those are covering most of the things I talked about, separating multiple values, analyzing the distribution, and cleaning up inconsistencies. 
I will just briefly talk about the linked data applications because this is definitely something that I have not used it for. But similar to how MarkEdit had the MarkNext functions, OpenRefine also allows you to encode your data in a way that it can be used for linked data and link it to um, other sources. Um, let's see. And just for the record, you can get your data out of here by exporting it in um, a variety of sources. And um, these extensions um, built in, it has Freebase, which is um, a store of linked data um, data, um, similar to kind of Wikipedia type data that's out there. And so you can choose to link it to um, other systems that are out there and then make yours available and it will use identifiers and things like that that are already available in a linked data world. Um, let's see here. We have a couple questions coming in. Can you remove specific data, for instance, 505 fields that are just a list of the alphabet? <laughs> yeah, I can see why you would want that in your data. Um, specifically with OpenRefine, um, I, I assume that you could. Um, what I would say you could do, let's see. Um, I think that if you, you know, you you go through and sort your data, and you, you you'll get a list here, and so if you see the one that you want, like the the A B C D E F G, etc., you can choose um, edit, and I think you can just delete it all and say apply, and it will just get rid of anything that has that data in it. Um, you could also do that in Mark Edit, what we were talking about earlier. Um, when I did the delete field option, I didn't specify a particular type of data in a field. I just told it to delete all the 994 fields. But you could um, tell it to delete a 505 field and then specify um, in your um, field text where you would you know exactly what it is that you want to remove. So I believe either of these pieces of software could accomplish that for you. Um, another question coming in, does it handle diacritics correctly? That one I do not know off the top of my head. Um, I don't work with a lot of items that have diacritics in their text, so I'm going to have to unfortunately defer that for you. I can certainly research that and, and um, email you the answer if you are interested. But you probably also could search the documentation on the OpenRefine site, and um, they, I'm sure they can answer your question on that. Um, we have another question coming in. Does Mark Edit or OpenRefine have a spell checker tool or a way to find the spellings? Um, for Mark Edit, yes, I'm, I'm pretty sure it does. I, I believe I have used that. OpenRefine, um, I'm not so sure. I mean, I, I will say I've never personally used it. I you know, with the powers that it has, the fact that it can, you know, identify things that are not capitalized consistently, I am, you know, confident that you would be able to find a way to do, to, to look for misspellings. Um, you know, when it does the cluster thing, um, we also saw capitalization differences just based on um, the data that we have here, but certainly I would say, you know, if you were looking at a particular field and you asked it to cluster things that were similar, it would I believe it would bring together, you know, both correctly spelled and incorrectly spelled versions, and then you could change the correctly ones, spelled ones, to correctly spelled ones. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, does anybody else have any questions coming in? And like I said, I feel like I've just, you know, totally scratched the surface on both of these, especially OpenRefine. I know it can do way more things than um, I just showed you. you know, either of these could easily be a full day presentation on their own, but hopefully this has given you um, some information so that you can jump in and explore these things on your own. Um, I would definitely be glad to answer any other questions you have, um, either now if you think of them, or you can definitely email me later. Um, I have the links available now under my own personal delicious account. They will also be on the um, the Library Commission's website when the recording is ready. So, um, waiting a second to see if there's any other questions coming in. If not, then I thank you for attending and please join the library before.
uh, more Encompass Lives in the future. Thanks. Bye-bye.